Okay. Yes. We will just start in a minute. We are going live on YouTube as well. So uh, let's try. Okay. Team is uh, just going live. Okay, so now uh, we are uh, even live on YouTube. So we will start and uh, so uh, I'm posting this uh, link, Yutika, in the planning meet, planning team and winter team. So you guys circulate it uh, to every group, okay? Yes, sir. Let me know whenever we are ready to go. Yeah, we are. Uh, we are just, uh, just. I think uh, thirty to forty seconds. We are ready. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'm loud enough, right? Yes. Okay. You are. Yeah. So, guys, can we circulate it uh, in other groups as well? Dilna, please do that. In all the groups, and even in the Telegram or in our uh, channels also. Okay, great. Yes, sir. Yeah, so we have uh, around, uh, yeah. Uh, so ma'am, actually uh, our, uh, you know, here we have restricted uh, Zoom to uh, our interns and our uh, guests only. Okay. okay, and okay. we are on the YouTube actually. The full uh, our students and participants are joining in YouTube. Okay. Okay, yeah. So, yes, Yutika, shall we start? Yes, sir, sure, sir. Okay. okay. Hello and good evening, everyone. How are you all feeling this evening? I hope you all are doing great. Welcome to the most intriguing webinar on congenital heart diseases. I'm Yutika Salvi. I'm the third year student and a research intern at Climate Research Solutions, 
and I will be your host for today. This webinar is a small initiative by Cleaver Public Health Awareness Series under Climate Research Solutions. Cleaver Public Health Awareness Series is an initiative under Climate Research Solutions that presents you 365 days of learning. The concept is to create an educational hub where we spread awareness in different forms like webinars, podcasts, and competitions, which act as one-stop solution to clear all myths and queries regarding various healthcare-related issues. A platform open to all for curative, limited, informative, public health awareness series, which is learning throughout the year. Let's not waste any time and slide right into our session. But before that, I would like to add a few key points. Please keep yourselves on mute throughout the sessions. If you have any doubt, please type in the comments or in the chat box and we will clear it out at the end of the session. With greatest pleasure, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Gunjan Banga Ma'am. Dr. Gunjan Banga Ma'am is an assistant professor of pediatric cardiology at Manipal University, Manipal, Karnataka. She has her medication licensure or certification in pediatric cardiology and general pediatrics from American Board of Pediatrics, New Jersey Medical Board license. Ma'am has received many awards like 2014 and 2015 Dean's Scholarly Achievement Award, Texas Tech University, second place in resident poster presentation category, eighth annual student and resident research day, Texas Tech University, 2014, Chief Resident for the Year, Resident Teacher Award voted by Medical Students, Passionate Resident Award voted by Peers, 2013 and 14. Dr. Gunjan Ma'am has memberships in professional societies like American Society of Echocardiography, American College of Cardiology, American College of Pediatrics. Ma'am has multiple publications in her name and has participated in countless oral and poster presentations. We welcome you, Ma'am. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Ajit Singh, co-founder and CEO at Climate Research Solutions, National Director of Research at World Youth Heart Federation. Over to you, oh, sir. Yes, thank you, Yutika. Uh, so I remember my days in cardiology, KMC Manipal, <laughs> and we used to interact, uh, you know, uh, to madam, and we used to see many infants and many small babies in our wards and our, you know, uh, in our, uh, unit in our OPDs were coming and, uh, you know, actually, uh, if we look at the CHDs, congenital heart disease, there are a variety of congenital heart diseases. You know, even in normal, uh, people know like there are the hole in heart, uh, you have only one chamber in heart. There are miscellaneous, uh, you know, names, uh, what we usually know about the congenital heart disease, but scientifically there are actually many more, you know, many more the different types of, you know, septal defects, different types of, uh, uh, you know, cyanotic effects, and I mean, many problems are there in uh, congenital diseases. And the prevalence of congenital heart disease is not very less. It is huge and it's a worrisome problem. And not actually because now treatments are available. Now, you know, small surgeries are available, devices are available to, uh, you know, uh, treat our infants, our kids. So, uh, but still in our rural areas, in our even developing, uh, you know, cities and uh, our towns, people are not much aware of these things. They just feel like when our kids are there, even in my family, I have seen when uh, I was young, when I was young, I have seen in my family also, I used to be in the villages and I, I have seen like, you know, people have... Uh, uh, you know, some mnemonic, mnemonic uh, symptoms and, uh, you know, uh, they are going uh, for the pneumonia treatment every week, every month. But later on, when they are going to the specialized, uh, you know, uh, when they're going to the expert or, uh, you know, super specialist, uh, then they are coming, they, they're getting that, oh, they have some heart disease, there is some VSD or ASD or some other problems related to heart, but not exactly the pneumonia or not exactly the infections. So uh, these things we have to know and we need a good, uh, you know, expertise to uh, understand the things. So that's why today we call Dr. Gunjan uh, Banga ma'am and uh, she is the pediatric and uh, fetal cardiologist at uh, uh, KMC, uh, you know, uh, Department of Cardiology. And uh, she is very expert and, you know, uh, she has a vast knowledge and uh, her, uh, you know, education and fellowships are, uh, you know, she has done in USA. So uh, thank you, ma'am, for joining us uh, for this webinar and to, uh, you know, spread the awareness and knowledge. So 
thank you very much for accepting our in, uh, invitation now platform is yours ma'am please thank you thank you so much for the invitation and i couldn't be happier sharing this knowledge with you guys the timing is more than perfect because as you guys know this is actually the heart um, health month month of february so just keeping in mind the time constraints we'll dive straight into the topic but also i just you know would add to what dr ajit just said there are more than 100 known congenital heart diseases if you take into account all the variants also so we'll try to cover some of the basics and the some of the more commonly encountered ones so you know so as to get you guys started when you read up about them you know what we were talking about and uh, i can be reached out at any point of time now or later and uh, if there's any question any query please feel free to interrupt me and i apologize if the talk seems too basic for some or too complicated for some like i said just interrupt and we'll go over it uh, step by step all right so uh, i do not have any disclosures i am an imaging cardiologist so you may see a lot of echo images in there too okay so like i said this is um, heart awareness month uh, the month of february which initially started out uh, in uh, america actually and then the rest of the world also took it over because uh, the burden of congenital burden of cardiovascular disease is uh, a lot in all the countries it's sort of one of the biggest killer um if you exclude uh, accidental deaths and then uh, once that took over people were realizing that okay kids are not necessarily adults and the type of heart diseases they present with are completely different so that's when people started realizing that we need to spread awareness about congenital heart disease as well and that's when the congenital heart uh, defect awareness week started which is the week of uh, uh february 7th to 14th so we missed it just by a little bit but uh, never too late we will get started um i know there are not many people here on this uh, platform right now but does anybody recognize this uh, celebrity from india yes of course madhubala <laughs> okay so she was popularly known as uh, beauty with tragedy and that was for a reason she's often compared with the uh, Hollywood actress uh, Marilyn Monroe and um, why was she called uh, beauty with tragedy is because she was born with congenital heart disease and that led to her early demise uh, at a tender age of 36 because she developed complications her heart disease wasn't recognized early enough so you know that just brings us to the point that people don't know much about congenital heart disease um things are getting better but still not at the uh, point where we should be so just to um, honor her uh, google actually launched a doodle in her name on her 86th uh, birth anniversary which also happens to be valentine's day february the 14th uh, two years ago so that's what the doodle looked like and uh, the congenital heart disease that she was born with was a ventricular septal defect and you would think easily treatable right but just missed the diagnosis and she developed complications from it and uh, died very early so like i said heart month is celebrated to motivate people so they can adopt healthy lifestyles and prevent the cardiovascular disease and uh, congenital heart defect awareness week came later on to be recognized from february 7th to 14th So today what we will be focusing on is understanding the presentation of congenital heart disease uh broadly classified as cyanotic and asyanotic and again there's a gray zone there's a big gray zone in there and we'll be uh talking a little bit about the physiology and anatomy of the congenital heart disease So what is congenital heart disease a gross structural abnormality congenital so somebody is born with it uh of the heart as well as the intrathoracic vessels um that is of functional significance so it is impairing the life of the patient uh the magnitude of the problem is quite under recognized in a country like ours or in any developing nation actually um the prevalence of congenital heart disease in india is same as any other um, developed nation which is 8 per 1000 life births but the difference is that our birth rate is tremendously high the population is just too much so the total number of children who are born with congenital heart disease every year is a lot more than any other nation 
which is 200,000. And of these 40 to 50% have a major congenital heart disease. And uh, we'll, as we progress and talk more about congenital heart disease, you'll be able to see which ones are actually classified as major congenital heart disease. Something that really needs intervention within the first year of life as a rule of thumb can be considered as a major congenital heart disease. So it really poses a tremendous challenge, you know, to the families, the society and the healthcare system. One cardiac center in America caters to a population of 120,000, which when you compare to India, it will be 16 lakh uh, patients to one cardiac center. So we do not have many available resources. Patients go unrecognized, the disease goes unrecognized, and by the time they present, um, the condition is inoperable. And remember, all these are structural heart defects. Somebody was born with the wrong heart. So medications do not do anything for these patients. The only option is surgical correction or some sort of a procedure to palliate these patients. Um, so if you consider that number of um, heart disease patients in India, only one fourth of them are actually getting the care they need. So we are really lagging behind. The number of cardiac centers has increased in the last decade or so. But again, like I said, we are nowhere close to where we should be. So like um, initially I mentioned, we'll be talking broadly two categories of congenital heart disease, asynotic and synotic. And um, at this point of time, I may not try to cover the gray zone because I'll end up confusing everybody. So in asynotic congenital heart disease, the major um, types are the shunt lesions, commonly known as. Um, they shunt from left heart to right heart. So the shunt can be at the level of atria, an atrial septal defect at the level of ventricles, a ventricular septal defect at the level of um, great arteries, we call that as a patent ductus arteriosus between the aorta and pulmonary artery. And um, often uh, PDA, which when huge and wide is also known as an aortopulmonary window. So, Talking first about atrial septal defects, about seven to 10 percent of congenital heart disease um, is atrial septal defects, and there are many types of atrial septal defects. The most common being secundum type of atrial septal defect, others being primum, sinus venosus, and coronary sinus. Now, the classification entirely depends upon where exactly is that hole located in the atrial septum. So, the one that is located right in the center of the atrial septum is what we call as the secundum type of atrial septal defect. And when it is towards the um, AV valves, it is the primum type. Sinus venosus is uh, where the SVC and IVC come. And then coronary sinus is very rare, close to the coronary sinus, of course. Now, the blood usually shunts from left to right at an atrial septal defect, unless there is some other associated pathology. Um, the question that is often put to the students and residents is, what do you think the shunting at an ASD depends on? Because, you know, the patients who have ASD are not usually that symptomatic. It is the patients who have BSD or PDA are more symptomatic and require early intervention than patients with ASD. So why so? So let's talk about that a little bit. So shunting at ASD actually depends upon how compliant the right side of the heart is, right atrium, right ventricle, and pulmonary circulation. And that usually is very compliant. It can dilate and dilate and dilate and um, patient will not experience anything. So shunting at an ASD depends upon the relative difference of compliance between the left and the right ventricle and also upon the size of the ASD. So patients who have ASD are usually asymptomatic because they've been living their life as such since the time of birth. Uh, oftentimes when you fix those ASDs, they would come and tell you how energetic and, you know, well they feel. So some of them may have some symptoms of fatigue initially, they, that goes unrecognized. And other than that, they have a systolic ejection murmur, which is in the pulmonary area. And that comes from increased blood flow through the pulmonary valve, because there's more blood coming from left side to right side. So that blood has to exit from the pulmonary valve and that produces the murmur. The murmur actually sounds quite similar to the murmur um, in anemia or an innocent heart murmur. So that's when um, 
you have to be careful that you are not missing any SD. So what, what else you could pay attention to? You could pay attention to the second heart sound. There's splitting, fixed splitting of second heart sound. And that again is because there's increased uh, volume on the right side of the heart that has to exit from the pulmonary valve. So that causes the splitting to be widened compared to the normal splitting. And sometimes they may have a diastolic murmur from the relatively increased flow through the tricuspid valve. So sometimes when the patients are asymptomatic and for whatever reason got an EKG and you see these features where there's right axis deviation, uh, positive in one, positive in two, and positive in AVF, and uh, there's signs of right atrial enlargement where there's tall peaking of uh, P waves, and then RSR pattern. RSR pattern indicates volume overload. So such patients, you must always consider obtaining an echocardiogram uh, to rule out an ASD. So here is just a, a image of an atrial septal defect. This is what we obtain in the sub xiphoid view or uh, from the subcostal images, left atrium and right atrium. And there is a shunt through it. You see that red flow crossing the atrial septum. Uh, and then there is right side enlargement, RA enlargement, RB enlargement. Again, you see there's a size discrepancy between the left heart and the right heart. So in ASD, the side that enlarges is right heart, RA and RB, because they are extremely compliant and the shunt is at the level of atrial septum. That is quite different from the next two lesions that we will talk about. So how do we manage these patients? So in the first few years, rate of spontaneous closure is pretty high and uh, we just follow up these patients. And like I said, since they're asymptomatic, um, nothing needs to be done, no medications. Very rarely would a patient have symptoms of failing to thrive or you know, recurrent respiratory infections, more so in patients who were either born premature or have pre-existing lung issues. Otherwise, healthy people with an ASD hardly are ever symptomatic. So what is our goal really to um, you know, intervene on an ASD if it's not causing any problem right now is later on down the lane because of all this increased blood flow to the lungs, the pulmonary arterioles are under, going to undergo um, remodeling. There'll be um, arterioles would undergo increased musculinization and they may obliterate over time leading rise to pulmonary hypertension and then reversal of shunt as is referred to as Eisenmenger syndrome. So other problem these patients can encounter is atrial arrhythmia, you know, huge boggy right atrium. So they can have atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, and that also increases with age, the incidence. A patient who is greater than 60 years of age may have a 60% chance of having an atrial arrhythmia compared to somebody who's younger than 10 years, maybe a person chance of having an arrhythmia and then increased uh, risk of pulmonary uh, paradoxical embolism because of shunting from right to left over time. So if the ASD is hemodynamically significant, we usually try to close um, around three to four years of age. The reason also being, you know, the kids are gonna go to school or daycare. So there'll be, um, there's a high risk of exposure to viruses. So you wanna prevent all those uh, recurrent infections because there's increased blood flow to the lungs. So they are going to be at increased risk of uh, pulmonary infections compared to a person without an ASD. And then as far as closing them is concerned, usually our first preferred uh, choice is closing through a device in a cat lab. This is sort of a classical and a more go-to device, an Implaza device that is used, which you um, access the patient uh, patient's leg through the femoral vein and you pass the catheter into the right heart through the hole, launch the device out, out and done, close forever. Again, risks are involved just like any other procedure and do, patients do need a long-term follow-up. And if there, are device, if there are ASDs that are not closable by device just because they are huge or their location is such that you may be obliterating the AV valve, you may be uh, obliterating the pulmonary veins or systemic veins, then you directly refer the patient for surgical closure, which is a patch closure or a suture closure of ASD, which surgeon decides once they open up the heart. It is an open heart procedure, 
and uh, post operative complications usually being uh, post pericardiotomy syndrome or uh, you know um, atrial arrhythmias induction block in addition to bleeding and infection risk <clears throat> so sometimes this interatrial shunt is actually crucial you know um, you want to leave it open and if it's not open enough you want to open it up patients with transposition we'll talk about why so patients with total anomalous pulmonary venous return tricuspid atresia hypoplastic left heart syndrome because that is when the heart will be decompressing through that asd or they will promote mixing so the oxygenated blood can get to the body um again a question for students and residents is um, associated syndromes with asd genetic syndrome so noonan syndrome William syndrome, Down syndrome, Holtorum and Tar syndrome are particularly the favorite questions. So, um, absent radius syndrome with thrombocytopenia, um, and Ellis Van Creveld syndrome, which uh, is very rarely seen in India, but um, they do have few cases. Um, moving on to the next septal defect, which is further lower in the heart, so ventricular septal defect. It is in the interventricular septum. it is the most common congenital heart disease almost 50 to 60% um so when the heart is forming it is really a single tube and when the ventricles form there is a defective formation of the interventricular septum leading rise to some of these holes uh so the classification is again based on where they are located with respect to the av valves and the outflow valves so aorta and pulmonary tract so the type of vsds can be conoventricular vsd which are high up malalignment type vsd which are just below the aorta and pulmonary tract muscular type uh constitute in the are present in the body of the ventricular septum right down here and inlet type as the name suggests is close to the inlet the av valves uh, most common being the ones in the perimembranous area or the conoventricular area and why do we need to know all this is because the approach to closing these vsds is going to be different so you can't just mention to a surgeon that there's a vsd they need to know where the vsd is so when they open up the heart they can't just be blindly looking for it they need to know if they have to go through tricuspid valve they need to know if they have to go through the outflow tract to be able to close it you know the baby's heart is as big as a fist so you have to try to provide the maximum amount of information for the surgeon for the success of the surgery so size of the vsd is defined relative to the size of the aortic valve a small vsd means it's less than 1/3 of the size of the aortic valve moderate would be 1/3 to 2/3 and large would be something that is even bigger than 2/3 uh patients will present with murmur only time murmur is absent is in a newborn period when the pulmonary vascular resistance is still high and also if the vsd is too large it's not going to produce any turbulence that's what murmur is right the turbulence of flow that you hear through the stethoscope so it may be absent if the vsd is too huge uh and murmur in this would be a pan systolic murmur heard best over the left lower sternal border and radiating to the axilla again question for the residents then diastolic rumble uh, may be present indicating increased flow through the mitral valve when the blood shunts in, at the level of ventricular septum it's going to shunt from lv to rv to pulmonary circulation and back through the pulmonary veins into the left heart so the enlargement in a vsd is seen of the left heart in contrast to the asd where ra and rv are enlarged in vsd it is the la and lv that get enlarged so the diastolic number <laughs> Sorry, anybody wants to say something? Okay, so um, diastolic rumble at the apex indicates increased flow through the mitral valve. It is also sort of an indirect indicator that the pulmonary flow is more than one point five. It you know the flow through the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit should be one to one in a normal heart. If there's a hole, there's going to be imbalance there. so it the diastolic rumble really is sort of an indirect indication that okay the flow is significant and patient does need intervention and patients would present with features of congestive heart failure so tachypnea failure to grow 
sweating with treats, suck rest, suck cycle. They would take a few uh, minutes of breastfeeding, they'll stop. They'll take again, stop. Because they get tired and that's an exercise for them. So what does the chest x-ray look like? There's increased flow to the lungs. So increased vascularity and then there's also cardiomegaly. Uh, what does ECG look like? There's enlargement definitely going to be of the left heart, but sometimes they could also have biventricular hypertrophy if it has been a long-standing VSD. And then left atrial enlargement, so, you know, broadened P waves. Uh, again, just briefly trying to show you the image of the ventricular septal defect here. This is the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. And that's the interventricular septum. You see a hole there. You see the color flow through it. So that is a ventricular septal defect. So how do we manage these patients? You know, not every patient we can send for surgery right away, especially in the neonatal period. The risks are high. The heart is too small. So sometimes what we do is uh, try to buy some time, have them gain some weight and get closer to three to four months of age. Um, and then decide on closing a large VSD. The other reason for waiting also is that some of the VSDs may get smaller in size over time or some may spontaneously close. So you just uh, maintain them on anti-heart failure medications in the form of diuretics like Lasix or furosemide and digoxin. You can give them increased calories because they're burning more calories. So you want them to gain weight. You give them increased calories, slightly increased volume compared to a normal baby. And then uh, mostly surgical repair. If it is a muscular VSD, which is right in the muscular septum, in the middle of the ventricular septum, then sometimes device closure can be attempted. Uh, moving on to the third type of uh, shunt lesion, the left to right shunt lesion, we have atrioventricular septal defects. You know, when you see that name, the first thing that should come to your mind is, was the patient tested for trisomy 21 or Down syndrome? because 50% of these patients do have Down syndrome. And that adds another level of complexity to their care. They're going to be, they're going to be poor feeders. They are going to have elevated pulmonary vascular resistance for a long time. So the decision as to when they should be repaired becomes a little tricky. So what really happened here is uh, endocardial cushions, when they were starting to form in order to form the AV valve and also close the atrial and the ventricular septum and bring them together, they didn't form. So leave, living, uh, giving rise to this huge hole in the center of the heart, leading to an atrial septal defect and a huge ventricular septal defect. So that kind of an atrial septal defect is called a primum type of atrial septal defect. And this kind of a ventricular septal defect, like I told you in the inlets, is known as the inlet type of ventricular septal defect. Again, we like to classify everything in pediatric cardiology. So there's um, complete type, transitional type, and incomplete type. Um, not necessarily for you to know, but it only depends upon what the size of VSD is. And then there's furthermore classification that we don't have to discuss right now. Like I said, 50% of these patients do have Down syndrome. And that's when the policy comes into picture from the American uh, Academy that anybody born with trisomy 21 or Down syndrome should undergo a screening echocardiogram right after birth. Whether it has any clinical findings of a structural heart disease or not, you have to get an echocardiogram. So their clinical presentation, initially, they may not have a heart murmur as long as the PBR is elevated. Also because the VSD is huge, so the turbulence may not be there. But over time, once the PVR or the pulmonary vascular resistance starts to drop, the murmur becomes more pronounced, that of a flow murmur, like a systolic ejection murmur in the pulmonary region. Sometimes, if the VSD is not that big, they may have a holosystolic murmur of the VSD. Uh, occasionally, so, you know, the endocardial cushions didn't develop, so the AV valve is also abnormal. There's only one AV valve. It didn't divide. So that AV valve is often abnormal and maybe regurgitant with a backflow of blood. That may also produce another murmur. The ECG, this is one of the lesions where ECG is actually diagnostic. Otherwise, ECG is a very non-specific test um, for pediatric cardiologists. So 
in patients who have atrioventricular septal defects or AV canal defects, they have a superior axis, a left axis deviation. That is because of the location of the AV node because there's a hole right there. So negative axis in lead one, two, and AVF. And then they may have biventricular hypertrophy just from the presence of a huge PSD. So when you see that <clears throat> superior axis, that also, it, even when the patient is asymptomatic, even when the patient doesn't have Down syndrome, you should still consider obtaining an echocardiogram. So again, how would these patients present? Anyone with left to right shunt is going to have features of congestive heart failure, except for pure atrial septal defect, because that is going to shunt to right atrium and right ventricle, and because of increased compliance of the right heart may not become symptomatic. Other lesions, they are going to cause enlargement of the left heart and increased, tremendously increased flow to the lungs at an increased pressure, because it is at the level of ventricular septum, at an increased pressure, not only the volume is high, but the pressure also is high. So they will develop pulmonary vascular disease much, much sooner than a patient with atrial septal defect. Hence, the need for early intervention. So if you see a huge VSD, you know it's not going to close or get smaller. So you have to counsel the family accordingly that around four to six months of age, we will intervene unless the patient is very symptomatic before that. So until then, we can maintain them on diuresis, we can maintain them on digoxin. But if the patient is very symptomatic, not gaining weight at all, sweating and repeated infections, then you have to intervene early, either through closure of the VSD, and if it seems like baby is too small to undergo that, we can do a temporizing measure. We can uh, occlude the pulmonary artery temporarily, band it, not altogether, slightly tighten it, so that way less blood will go to the lungs, and they would not be as symptomatic. And then when they start to gain some weight, they're a little bit older, then we can decide on the full closure of the defect. Coming to the last shunt lesion that I'm gonna talk about, that is the parent ductus arteriosus, which is actually a normal connection, right? And fetuses, they need ductus arteriosus because lungs are not working, so the blood has to bypass the lungs. So it shunts from pulmonary artery to aorta. And when that doesn't close, usually supposed to close within 24 hours and anatomically within three to four weeks. And if it doesn't close, then we have to intervene. So sometimes it may be large enough that patient will show signs of congestive heart failure, left ventricular hypertrophy. Sometimes it may not be that big and you can wait and watch. Um, so the rule of thumb is if the patent ductus arteriosus is silent, silent meaning that you cannot hear a murmur, but you saw it on echo, uh, then no need to intervene. The other reason for intervention is that if it's loud enough for you to hear, that means the flow through it is turbulent, which means that there is going to be an increased risk of developing bacterial endocarditis later in life or at any point in time. So that's when you recommend closing it. And our, um, First preference is to close it in the cardiac cath lab, um, which is, um, you know, exper at experience centers, they can close in babies as small as 700 grams. And other option, if it's not closable in the cath lab, is to go for surgical ligation. In premature babies, sometimes medical closure can be attempted by giving them Rufin, Indomethacin, or paracetamol or acetaminophen. That, however, doesn't work in term infants just because the type of PDA the premature infants have and the term infants have is different. The ductal tissue um, sitting in the PDA is different. So in term infants, it's not going to respond to those medications. So when, like I mentioned earlier, if a left to right shunt is significant enough and is left unrepaired, that can lead to Eisenmenger syndrome or complex, which is irreversible. And pulmonary vasculature undergoes changes that cannot be reversed. You can uh, palliate the patient, give them medications uh, for symptom relief, but you know they don't have a long life. Um, briefly talking about aortic and pulmonary valve stenosis. So aortic stenosis is about five to eight percent of congenital heart disease, and pulmonary is about eight to ten percent. They are also asynodic congenital heart diseases, 
but again, they sort of fall in the gray zone. Um, the stenosis in either of them is referred to as critical when they are dependent on the PDA. That means the flow of blood through the aortic valve or the pulmonary valve is so little that it cannot maintain the systemic output or it cannot be enough to go to the lungs to get oxygenated and come back. So when there is aortic stenosis, sometimes what happens is down the line. So aortic arch, ascending aorta, descending aorta, coarctation, all of that can be small. Left atrium can be small. Left ventricular can be small because there's not enough egress. Murmur at both of, in both of them is going to be that of an abnormal valve. So an ejection systolic murmur and in the aortic area and the pulmonary area. Sometimes they may have an ejection click as well. EKG will show signs of ventricular hypertrophy, RV in case of pulmonary stenosis and LV in case of aortic stenosis. So management really is, first of all, you have to decide if they are critical or not. If they are critical, you maintain the PDA open. You give them prostaglandins. And then you um, intervene by ballooning that valve, which if unsuccessful, can be referred for surgical opening. Some centers prefer surgical opening over ballooning just because uh, in patients with balloon intervention sometimes require repeat interventions. Surgical valvuloplasty obviously also carries its own risks. And if it's a um, milder degree of stenosis, that is something you have to follow over time. You just cannot assume that this is how it's going to remain because there are chances that it's going to worse as the baby grows. So these patients do need long-term follow-up. Uh, another common lesion to encounter is coarctation and interruption of aorta, and a uh, rather important one because often gets missed. And um, we definitely should pay attention to babies getting discharged uh, because that's right after discharges when they start getting symptomatic. So what we mean by coarctation of aorta is um, coarctation, so narrowing. Narrowing is developing at the Isthmus. Isthmus is just below the origin of the subclavian artery. So right where the descending aorta starts. Sometimes the rest of the arch may also be small. And sometimes the narrowing is so tight that there's hardly any flow through it. And it may be just interrupted. That is, there are two segments of the arch. They are not continuous. So Oftentimes, this gets detected on newborn pulse oximetry screening, which I'll talk about. That is another kind of a measure that uh, has been started in order to pick up these critical congenital heart diseases before the baby gets discharged. Because these are the patients who once go home and become symptomatic, they are really hard to resuscitate because of the type of congenital heart disease they have. So a patient with coarctation will have decreased pulses in the lower extremity because descending aorta is hardly getting any flow. Um, this is just an animation to show. We'll quickly go over it. I know we are tight on time, uh, but see the amount of blood that is um, going from left atrium to left ventricle and see the amount that is actually crossing the coarctation segment is so little. So they will have decreased perfusion to their lower body, the kidneys, the gut ischemia, decreased pulses in the lower extremity. So always, always, always check femoral pulses in a new baby before getting discharged. And uh, these are the patients who are gonna need PDA. They get symptomatic once the PDA starts to close because until PDA was open, circulation was being maintained by the PDA. Once it starts to close, undergoes its anatomical closure, that's when the urine output starts to decrease. They don't want to feed much. They're lethargic. Pulses are feeble. So around two to three weeks of age. And um, sometimes coarctation gets noticed in um, older age group kids like teenagers when they are being worked up for hypertension. Because um, pediatrician will notice that the blood pressure is higher in the upper extremity and lower in the lower extremity. So what we do is once it gets diagnosed, you start prostaglandins in these babies because you want to keep PDA open. And then plan surgery. Sometimes you can also balloon that coarctation segment or put a stent in there to keep it open. 
that really is a measure for older kids not too much of a success rate in uh, younger kids or you could attempt it in infants only when you know you don't have any other option kid is really sick and is not stable enough to undergo an open heart surgery moving on to uh, cyanotic congenital heart disease a favorite topic for um, examiners so five t's of cyanotic congenital heart disease commonly referred um, to tetralogy of fallo transposition of great arteries which are the more common one and then rarely truncus arteriosus tapvc or total anomalous pulmonary venous return or drainage and then tricuspid atresia so patients will have cyanosis in these heart diseases um tetralogy of fallo is the most common one and accounts for about 5% of congenital heart disease and as the name indicates tetralogy so there has have to be four components right um so first thing being a huge vsd which we also call as a malalignment type vsd because the duct, uh, the ventricular septal tissue is sort of malaligned and it is malaligned towards the pulmonary outflow so the pulmonary outflow gets narrow and obstructed and is smaller as a result there is right ventricular hypertrophy and aorta in response is huge so it sort of sits on the ventricular septum so that is your overriding of the aorta so those are the four components of tetralogy which is right ventricular hypertrophy overriding of aorta anterior malalignment type vsd and pulmonary stenosis now the presentation of these patients really depends upon how bad the stenosis is so there may be a systolic ejection murmur over the pulmonary area and presence of cyanosis because the when there is obstruction the blood is going to mix here at the level of ventricular septal defect so depending upon how cyanotic they are and how severe the narrowing is is how we decide when to intervene neonatal repair of tetralogy of fallo is um, not practiced at all cardiac centers so some of these patients who are symptomatic early on after birth undergo palliative procedure meaning just to buy time so as to increase some degree of flow to the lungs and when they get older they gain some weight then we intervene and do the full repair which includes closure of the ventricular septal defect and opening of the outflow tract patients who have tetralogy of fallo present with tet spells or a hypersynodic spell again a favorite question for examiners and um it is life threatening if not intervened upon you can lose your patient also is an indication that patient should undergo surgery and there's no reason to wait anymore usually tetralogy of fallo can be safely operated upon at around 4 to 6 months of age um this is just a picture diagram again an animation so the blood comes from left atrium to left ventricle and right atrium to right ventricle but see there's not enough of egress so it's going to mix right here and when it ejects through the aorta it's a mixed blood so patient is going to have cyanosis so surgical management includes closure of vsd as well as opening up of that rvot or right ventricular outflow tract or pulmonary tract you start you see some turbulence here that is because there is um narrowing of the pulmonary tract so in patients where you cannot do a complete repair right away you have to somehow increase some degree of pulmonary blood flow so how can we do that there are several uh, surgical procedures that can be used one of them is a modified blaylock thoracic thomas shunt uh, where we develop a connection an artificial connection between the aorta and pulmonary artery sometimes the connection can be established straight away from right ventricle to pulmonary artery where you are bypassing the pulmonary valve these patients do require lifelong follow up because you know they undergo a surgical incision on their ventricles to open up that right uh, pulmonary outflow and also to close the vsd so they are at risk for developing ventricular arrhythmias later in life and that increases their risk of sudden cardiac death so lifelong follow up is required and um, if anybody hasn't seen the movie uh, called uh, something lord gave you should see that it's a great movie about uh, how 
Blaylock Torsic shunt came into existence and how there was so much of racial discrimination in the field of medicine, even in um, countries like US. Okay, so hypersynotic spell briefly, just because how important it is um, clinically and for examiners too. Um, so when the patient cries is agitated, their pulmonary vascular resistance increases, they become tachycardic. So when that happens, there's gonna be further decreased blood flow to the lungs and the baby is gonna become even more synodic. If there's decreased blood flow to the lungs, that means there'll be lesser of pulmonary venous return. So cardiac output gets compromised. So patient would not only be cyanotic, but will be listless, pale. You know, you, you can just imagine losing a patient, looking gray. And also you would lose that murmur of pulmonary stenosis because there's no blood going through there. So patients who have iron deficiency anemia, they can have increased um, frequency of these head spells. How do you manage this? So first of all, first thing to do is calm the patient. Patients agitated is what provoked the spell. So calm the patient down, give it to the mother to hold the patient. You may have to sedate this patient, uh, putting them in a knee to chest position. So the systemic vascular resistance increases. That way the blood will prefer to go to pulmonary tract. You can also artificially increase the systemic vascular resistance by giving them drugs like phenylephrine. And then also, uh, mitigating the increased heart rate with metoprolol, giving them some increased fluids and oxygen cannot hurt. Um, the second most common synodic congenital heart disease is transposition of the great arteries. So what happens in transposition? Parallel circulation, as we refer to as, the great arteries are transposed. So left atrium, left ventricle is connected to right pulmonary artery, and right atrium, right ventricle is connected to aorta. So the blood from blood to the body is coming from right heart and blood to the lungs is coming from left heart. So ineffective circulation because that blood is already oxygenated. So what we need to do is somehow get that oxygen to the body. How can we do that? By causing some sort of mixing of the blood between the two. Now, if the patient already has a ventricular septal defect, then they may not be as synotic. If the patient has an atrial septal defect, they may not be syn as synotic. They will still be synotic because there's mixing, but that will um, you know, buy you some time for intervention and presence of a PDA. So clinically, um, they have seen that if the patient has two levels of mixing, that makes the patient stable enough to wait for surgery. Otherwise, an emergent procedure is needed right after diagnosis. So um, two level of shunting being ASD and PDA are the safest options because VSD, sometimes the mixing can be ineffective. Um, then patients will have a single heart sound, single second heart sound because of the relationship of aorta and pulmonary artery, they're anterior posterior. So they, uh, you may only hear the aortic component. And um, you can promote this mixing. Okay, so we'll look at this animation first. Uh, the blood is coming from pulmonary veins, left atrium, left ventricle, going to the lungs, mixing with the blue blood, and the blue blood is going to the body and resulting in patient being synotic. So they usually present pretty early within the first few hours after birth. And the chest X-ray, again, an exam question, an egg on string appearance. That's because the aorta and pulmonary artery are anteroposterior. So you do not see the classical orientation of the great arteries up top. They are anteroposterior, an egg on string appearance. ECG may be normal. Um, so when we have to manage these patients, you have to keep the PDA open. Like I said, you have to maintain those two levels of shunting. If the ASD is getting smaller or is already small, you have to open it up. You can take the patient to cardiac cath lab, put a balloon through that atrial septum, open it up, and then also start the prostaglandins on patient. And then you can wait for surgery. Uh, what do they do in surgery? Well, they have to reverse the connection, bring the aorta to LV, pulmonary artery to RV. Now, when they do that, remember the coronaries also have to be shifted. So that's when these patients need long-term follow-up because they have been seen to develop coronary artery disease over time. 
uh, with thinking of coronary arteries, coronary ischemia, ineffective exercise tolerance. So these patients need lifelong follow-up and often cardiac cat and CT scan at around seven to eight years of age to look at those coronaries. They can also develop aortic and pulmonary valve stenosis because when they are reversed, the suture sites can become narrow or there can be some degree of kinking involved. Um, the next uh, congen synotic congenital heart disease is truncus arteriosus, which is about two to 5% of congenital heart disease. So what happens when the heart is forming? Like I said, it's a single tube. So the one end develops the outflow tracts. A septum has to form in between for it to divide into two outflow tracts. When that doesn't develop, we have one outflow tract that goes to both aorta and pulmonary artery, truncus arteriosus. The important association is that this is often associated with chromosomal anomaly called de George syndrome or chromosome 22q11 deletion. Now, what happens there is they can have thymic hypoplasia, parathyroid hypoplasia. So these patients may be hypocalcemic and may present with seizures. And they also have compromised immune system. So they have to be monitored for infections. They may need um, antibiotic prophylaxis for the rest of their life if they have significant thymic hypoplasia. So here we see left heart, right heart, only one trunk, which gives rise to both aorta and pulmonary artery, which are connected. And then they often have VSD. Without a VSD, a patient cannot survive. And again, there's a classification system of truncus arteriosus as well, but um, we'll leave it at that here. So how is the presentation of these patients? Again, pretty early, cyanotic, right? 48 hours of birth, usually they would present within that time frame. So <clears throat> what would be the symptoms like? They are causing increased flow to the lungs. So pulmonary overcirculation, congestive heart failure. Here you see in this picture that there's a common outflow tract. And the, since there's only one semilunar valve, that valve is often abnormal. It's thickened, it's dysplastic. So there'll be some degree of narrowing involved, some degree of backflow on that valve. And um, truncal stenosis is what we call it. This is the truncal valve and some degree of truncal regurgitation. So they will have a systolic murmur heard loudest over the left sternal border as well as a loudest too. They may present with signs again of congestive heart failure, heptomegaly, tachypnea, difficulty feeding, failure to thrive. So what do we do for these patients? Well, we separate the both arteries out. For the time being, you could start with diuresing them and restricting fluids. And then surgical repair is usually within two weeks. Um, where you close the VSD and you establish a, another connection from right ventricle to pulmonary arteries and separate the aorta out. Again, they would also require lifelong follow-up. Any patient with congenital heart disease, unfortunately, ends up being followed by a pediatric cardiologist and later on an adult cardiologist for the rest of their lives because none of these um, procedures are free from uh, you know, lifelong complications. So this RV2PA connection that we develop, which is also called this RV2PA conduit, it requires reintervention. It gets narrow over a period of time. It gets calcified, especially as the patient ages. And also the valve, valve can become regurgitant. It may backflow. Like I said, chromosomal analysis is required as well as the serum calcium measurement. Um, we are getting close. Uh, so bear with me, please. Uh, total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage is another cyanotic congenital heart disease and uh, about 1%. What is happening here is pulmonary veins, as the name indicates, are draining abnormally. So what uh, they usually, instead of draining to the left atrium, they drain to the right atrium. And that may happen in many ways. It may drain through the SVC. The veins may connect to the SVC. They may connect to the IVC. They may connect to the coronary sinus, so supracardiac, infracardiac, intracardiac, total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. Physiologically, they can be obstructed or unobstructed. Problem will arise when they are obstructed, right? 
if they are obstructed, not enough blood is going to come back to the heart, especially the oxygenated blood. So the lungs would be crappy. There'll be pulmonary edema, pulmonary venous hypertension, and also there'll be decreased cardiac output, or they may be unobstructed. Those patients are the ones who usually present um, later on in life because the veins were not obstructed. So they were draining pretty fine to the right heart. It's just that the patient is cyanotic, which probably was not recognized. Um, the chest x-ray would show smaller heart because decreased return to the lung the heart rate and then uh, white out of the lung fields. And if you give these patients oxygen or prostaglandins, you're going to make them worse because what does oxygen and prostaglandins do? They decrease your pulmonary vascular resistance. That means increased flow again to the lungs, which are already crappy. So management is, if it is obstructed, you have no option but to intervene, surgical emergency. And if they are unobstructed, you have some time to wait, stabilize them, give them diuretics, restrict their fluids, and then plan surgery electively. Long-term follow-up is a must because what happens is where those veins were taken off from SVC or IVC or coronary sinus and put back together to the left atrium, that area where the sutures were placed can get obstructed over time. Not always happens, but there's a potential. So these patients need long-term follow-up because this is a disaster to manage once it gets obstructed. Reopening, reopening, reopening is never successful because it keeps getting reobstructed, reobstructed. And there's no way you can medically manage these patients. And unfortunately, they have a very bad outcome. So this is just um, a picture showing you or a video clip showing you how dilated the right heart is because all those veins, instead of coming to the left heart, are actually coming to the right heart. And you see this small chamber between, behind the left atrium where they were trying to come to the left heart, but that connection never developed. Instead, they came here and then went up and drained into the SVC in this parasternal short axis view. Okay, um, coming on next to single ventricle patients, tricuspid atresia or hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So what happens in patients who have single ventricle is, um, there could be a single ventricle of the left heart where the left heart is fine and the right heart is hypoplastic, or it could be hypoplastic left heart and right heart is fine. So again, um, bad, bad, bad disease to have because uh, there's no cure, it's only palliation. We are just uh, giving patients few years. So what really is wrong is that there's something wrong if it was a hypoplastic left heart, something wrong at the level of mitral valve or aortic valve. See the size discrepancy. There's hardly any left ventricle here. All of this is hypertrophied and occluded. And aorta so small and pulmonary artery so big. So what happens is they are going to need that PDA to cause to take blood to the body. Otherwise, there's no source of blood to the body. So you have to give these patients prostaglandin till, till a intervention is planned. Same could happen for the right heart, where the right heart would be hypoplastic, the tricuspid valve may be small, pulmonary outflow may be small, and aorta will be huge, left heart will be huge. And that point, PDA would be required to take that blood from aorta to pulmonary artery unlike hypoplastic left heart, where the PDA would be taking blood from pulmonary artery to aorta. So these are all duct-dependent lesions, also known as critical congenital heart disease, where you have to have to intervene right after birth. So patients have to undergo a single ventricle palliation, like I said. It's not curative, it's only palliation. And you can decide whether the patient is an eligible candidate for that or not when there are no two ventricles. There's only one viable ventricle. There is absence of um, normal atrioventricular connection, meaning the valve, AV valve, which is either the mitral or the tricuspid, is either severely stenotic or atretic. Um, the outflow tract is either severely stenotic or atretic. 
and any combination of these conditions, then you know that these patients have to undergo a single ventricle pathway. You cannot give them a regular heart. You can't just you know, open up the tricuspid valve and say this patient's going to be fine when the RV only is so small that it's not going to sustain the systemic venous return. So clinical presentation will depend upon if the cardiac output is okay or not and if pulmonary flow is okay or not. And what is needed for that? PDA. Whether it's a hypoplastic right heart or a hypoplastic left heart, PDA is critical. So once that PDA closes, poor systemic perfusion, feeble pulses, poor urine output, shock, martling in a hypoplastic left heart syndrome patient. And in patients with hypoplastic right heart, inadequate flow to the lungs. So inadequate oxygenation and cyanosis. So we keep the PDA open, we give them prostaglandins, but obviously that is not uh, only measure to take, right? You can't do that long-term. You have to have an IV access um, and patient cannot go home on prostaglandin. So after that, you plan the staged palliation, which is three stages. So you have to counsel these patients right after diagnosis, whether you made a diagnosis antenatally or after birth, that the baby is going to require three procedures minimum. And that also doesn't guarantee that he's going to make out of these procedures fine. So when we say palliation, meaning we are just palliating them. We are not curing anything. We are just bypassing what they are born with. So first stage palliation is usually within first two weeks. So what they do is either you keep the PDA open with prostaglandins or you put a stent in there, which is the hybrid procedure, or you establish a connection like we talked about, the BT shunt between the aorta and pulmonary artery or between the right ventricle and pulmonary artery. And whatever great vessel the baby was born with, whether it was aorta or pulmonary artery, depending which heart was hypoplastic, you make it into an aorta because you gave them artificial connection to the lungs. After that is what starts as the critical period because interstage period is very, very vulnerable. Any kind of a respiratory infection can kick off an imbalance between the circulations and you may lose your patient because this is very um, critical stage where the blood flow is very uh, minutely managed between aorta and that artificial pulmonary connection. Stage two is what we refer to as Glen or hemifontan procedure, where you take the venous return from the upper part of the body, the SVC, and connect it to the pulmonary arteries directly. The IVC keeps draining into the right atrium. You're sort of, you know, gradually giving um, heart time to take care of that increased blood volume. Uh, so it doesn't fail right away. Saturation in these patients is about 80 to 90%, and this stage is usually performed at four to six months of age. And the final stage is the Fontan procedure, usually done around two to three years of age, where you have taken IVC out of the right atrium and connected it to the pulmonary artery like you did to the SVC. So this whole thing is then called as the Fontan pathway, where both SVC and IVC drain to the pulmonary artery. Now that's a passive circuit. There's Nothing pumping blood to the lungs. It just goes whatever comes. And the rest of the heart is sort of functioning as the left heart pumping blood to the body. So what happens is now this is the right ventricle who's doing all this job of left ventricle. And it's not prepared to do so. So over time, the right ventricle craps out. It can fail. And that's when the patient starts developing signs of right heart failure and fontan failure. So like I said, these are palliative procedures. Uh, the lifespan is limited for the patient and exercise tolerance is limited. You have to counsel them. The patient cannot get pregnant, not going to have normal development, normal lifestyle. So um, very rarely is single ventricle palliation done in countries like India because of the resources involved and because of the outcomes. Again, the patient does need a lifelong follow-up. Now, the talk would be incomplete if we didn't talk about the pulse oximetry screening for um, critical congenital heart disease. Like I said, a critical congenital heart disease is any heart disease which is dependent upon PDA to maintain 
either the blood flow to the body or the blood flow to the lungs and has to undergo some sort of procedure within first 28 days of life. That is called as a critical congenital heart disease. Now, what is our goal? Our goal is to diagnose these lesions before baby goes home because once the duct closes, baby is in trouble. So how have we been doing that? Um, we've been doing a pulse oximetry screening and that screening is mandatory in Western countries. Um, the screening is now being done in um, few centers in India, not all the centers. We are one of them, but there's more that can be done because of the increased incidence of home deliveries or deliveries by um, you know, non-physician people or in smaller centers and villages. So this is a little bit of an easier way to screen them should we be able to provide them with a pulse oximetry machine. So what is done is you screen the right hand of the baby. You check the pulse ox in the right hand of the baby and any foot. Why we choose the right hand? Because we need a pre-ductal saturation before the PDA and a post-ductal saturation in the feet. So whenever there's a discrepancy between the pre and the post-ductal saturation, that is an indication that there is something wrong, mostly with the heart, but sometimes can also be the lungs, sometimes can also be the pulmonary hypertension. But hey, better be safe than sorry, right? So it's a pretty easy test. Before discharging the patient, within 48 hours of birth, you perform this test after one day of life, but before discharge. And if the saturations are greater than equal to 95% in both of them, or if there is a slight difference, slight meaning less than equal to 3%, that is acceptable. That's a screening that is passed. Baby has passed the test and there is no pathology. But if the saturation is less than 90% in either hand or feet, then that's a negative test. You repeat it after one hour. Again, same thing. You repeat it again. Again, same thing. Now that's a failed test, a positive screen. So baby needs an echocardiogram to figure out if it's a heart disease or a lung issue. The majority of the times, the problem is when it is in between that 90 to 95% or the difference is more than 3%. That's when you have to keep repeating, keep repeating two times. And again, if the test is failed, you get an echocardiogram and consult a pediatric cardiologist. because there are more chances that the baby does have a congenital heart disease. So pretty easy test to perform, it just needs education and needs equipment. And the goal should be that we should be able to get these two smaller centers as well to be able to pick up these critical lesions. So on um, that note, I'm gonna end. So we can conquer congenital heart disease. We just have to have increased awareness so just briefly, 1 million babies around the world are born with heart disease every year. And in India, 1 in 100 babies is born with heart disease with a total of 200,000 babies every year. 25%, that's a big number, is critical and needs intervention during the first year of life. Uh, this pulse oximetry screening that I talked about has picked up so many heart diseases in US that the numbers have declined by one third having you know having to lose a patient to congenital heart disease so we should seriously consider doing these tests in india as well and um, kids often can get acquired heart disease also in the form of hypertension so 9 out of 10 kids do have more sodium intake than recommended every kid requires 60 plus minutes a day of exercise and you're right how many of we do exercise and then even with families or kids who do not have a history of um, family history of uh, hypercholesterolemia should undergo routine screening with their cholesterol levels checked at nine to 11 years of age. And again, at 17 to 19 years of age. So if we can, you know, talk to more people, talk to common people about the type of congenital heart diseases that are encountered, be uh, mindful of them, be careful when um, fetal echoes are performed or antenatal scans are performed. We are gonna know more about these congenital heart diseases. And obviously um, doing more research, raising funds, raising charity. So those, those are the real aims of raising this awareness so we can um, provide the care to these kids that they need.
with that, I'm going to end. And um, this is my email address if anyone wants to um, contact for any more education or research or anything. You can reach out to me if there are any questions. Feel free to reach out to me at any time. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was quite an illuminating and insightful session. I think our audiences have gained a lot of knowledge on congenital heart diseases. Now I would like to request everyone to ask any questions regarding the topic. Yes, guys, uh, you should ask your questions. You should clear your doubts now uh, with ma'am. Uh, you put your questions in the chat box. I think, Yutika, you can take some questions from YouTube. There are one or two questions. Yes, sir. Just a minute. Ma'am, I'll read the questions out. Sure. Yeah. One question is from Sanskar Viramani. How can digital clubbing and cyanosis be ruled out for heart anomalies? as these two symptoms are not just limited to heart anomalies. Cyanosis also related to less blood flow in climatic changes. So if I'm understanding the question right, if you encounter a patient who has cyanosis and digital clubbing, how can you rule out if it's a congenital heart disease or not, right? So first of all, um, digital clubbing means that the patient has been quite hypoxemic for a prolonged period of time to undergo those changes in the digits. And if there's cyanosis, so clinically, there may not be more than um, more information that you can get, except for a patient telling you any more symptoms if they have been, you know, since birth, just failing to thrive, or they were not able to play like other kids, having to stop frequently, history of TED spells, anything like that you can obtain on history. And uh, clinically, obviously, you can look for any heart murmurs, anything else on your examination, um, heart sounds, splitting, non-splitting. And after that, you come down to just getting an echocardiogram. You know, nowadays it's widely available even um, in smaller places. And uh, you can get your diagnosis right away. Thank you so much, ma'am. And we have one more question, ma'am. How and why is rubella, that is German measles, infection in pregnant women related to CHD in their children? Genetic mutation is a reason that can be understood. So um, rubella is considered to be teratogenic. So what happens is um, first trimester of pregnancy is critical, right? That's when all the organs are developing. If any mother encounters any infection thereafter or you know, takes any medications or is exposed to any other teratogenic agent in the environment is less likely to um, pass on the problem to the baby because the organs are more or less developed heart develops at five to six weeks of life, pretty early, or weeks of gestation, I'm sorry, pretty early. So at that time, if the mother gets infected, that um, can be a teratogenic event for the developing heart. And exactly what is the pathogenesis that goes on there? What does the virus actually cause in that baby's heart is unknown, but that is when the um, infection, uh, when the congenital heart disease happens. And the kind of congenital heart disease that patients with rubella usually have is problems with a pulmonary outflow, congenital rubella syndrome, pulmonary outflow, pulmonary stenosis, branch pulmonary stenosis. So that first um, trimester of pregnancy is critical. You also tell these mothers not to take uh, ibuprofen because that is known to cause uh, duct closure, right? That's why we use it for premature babies because if the duct closes in uh, a pregnant mother when the baby is still developing, you know how critical the duct is. It's going to shunt blood from pulmonary artery to aorta. And if it closes, then it cannot do so. So not enough blood flow to the lungs and uh, increased uh, size of the right heart. Baby can develop hydropsin, intrauterine demise. So these teratogenic events happen in the first trimester of pregnancy. That is when the mothers need to be extra cautious. Even um, normal viral infections, not just measles, common cold, flu, et cetera, can sometimes be detrimental. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Sure. I think we don't have any more questions. <laughs> okay. It was an amazing experience to hear your incredibly interesting and informative session, ma'am. Thank you so much. <laughs>
it was it was really a detailed and very informative session ma'am uh, thank you very much again for accepting our invitation and uh, uh, right now we have around uh, 78 people uh, who are uh, watching us and listening us uh, through the youtube and zoom so i hope they got uh, many things about the congenital heart disease and uh, you know the detailed version through the echoes and ecgs through the diagnosis and the corrections and the, all the treatments so thank you very much ma'am thank you very much for joining you're welcome and, uh, yes thank you all for joining the session and we'll see you in our next sessions thank you very much take care guys thank you yudhika anything small notes too? yes please yudhika yes sir before leaving i have an interesting news for all of you we are launching our first podcast that is clipper So guys everyone stay tuned for brilliant podcast by great speakers please follow us on our social medias for more updates thank you so much for your valuable time thank you thank you yes thank you okay let's take care bye thank you